When we think of the liberal values of tolerance, limited government, the separation of church and state, and freedom of speech, we most certainly do not think of medieval Europe. Medieval Europe was a smorgasbord of hereditary monarchies supported by a patchwork of privileged nobles. Most liberals rightly think of the medieval ages as a very dark time for human freedom. The strict enforcement of religious orthodoxy, a lack of gender equality, a rigid hierarchical system, and a legal system that favoured the privileged elite made medieval Europe a time for which liberals rarely look back to for any sort of political wisdom. But even in the most unfree of times, there are a select few who can conceive of a better world, ruled not by what has been, but instead by what ought to be. While admittedly far from being a contemporary liberal or libertarian, I believe that the 12th century thinker John of Salisbury deserves a place in the limelight for his political writings, which stress the importance of free speech, the value of liberty, and most controversially for his day, when it was morally permissible to kill a tyrant. In reality, we know very, very little about the earliest days of John's life. He was born sometime around 1120 AD. He was born in England in a place called Old Sarum, or as it is called today, Salisbury. His family were by no means aristocrats. At best they were well-to-do, but with little status or prestige. John's nickname was Pavus, the Latin for small. This could have been a joke about his stature, but more likely it pointed towards his humble origins. His education was funded in part by his family, and wealthy patrons supplied the rest. The first year we can point to in John's life with any degree of certainty is 1136, when he arrived in Paris as a student at roughly the age of 15. 15 was the usual age when we would begin higher education at the time. During the medieval ages, education was generally undertaken to become a member of the clergy. John was educated by the best of his era, including Peter Abelard, one of the most renowned theologians of his day. While engaged in his studies, John learned about philosophy, rhetoric, literature, and of course, theology. In his later writings, found in his work known as the Metalogicon, John provided a colourful description of medieval university life and his experiences in it while defending the importance of the trivium, the teaching of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. By 1137, John moved to Chartres to study grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Influenced by a disciple of Bernard of Chartres, John became convinced of the importance of studying the thinkers of ancient Greece and Rome, for what he believed to be their timeless wisdom. Because of Bernard's influence, John would frequently pepper his later writings with references to ancient Greece and Rome, not only to show off his education, but to show the timelessness of their words. By 1140, John returned to Paris to study theology, to help fund his studies, he also tutored children on the side. After a little over a decade of studying, John finally completed his education and decided to settle down in Troyes, a town in northeastern France. Not much is known of precisely what John was doing here at the time, and whether or not he was in the service of a particular person. But what is known is that while residing in Troyes, he met a very influential churchman named Bernard of Clairvaux. Bernard took a liking to John and helped propel his ecclesiastical career by recommending him to Theobald, the current Archbishop of Canterbury. The Archbishop of Canterbury is the most important person in the English religious hierarchy. Theobald was an ardent defender of the Church's rights against the encroachments of the English monarchy. John quickly became Theobald's most esteemed and trusted secretary. He composed letters, oversaw a minister of matters, advised the Archbishop, and represented him as an envoy in the continental Europe. Suffice to say, John was a close and intimate ally of Theobald. Many of Theobald's associates had a similar education to John's, and thus he always found himself surrounded by fellow intellectuals to discuss and debate to his heart's content. While working, John met Thomas Becket, the future saint who was also in Theobald's service before becoming the King's Chancellor in 1154. During the medieval ages, monarchy was the dominant form of government, but even monarchies were subjected to a higher power. The Catholic Church held immense sway over political life, holding the power to excommunicate pious rulers, which often delegitimized the fragile balance of power in medieval politics. At a time when nearly everyone believed in heaven and hell, excommunication was a huge deal, to be ruled over by a king who was not part of the church was very questionable. On top of this, bishops were generally very wealthy, holding huge tracts of land and acted as advisors to their respective kings. If a churchman was accused of a crime, he was not tried by the king's court, but in fact by a completely separate court by the church, where punishments were often much more lenient. While John was completing his studies, the king of England named Stephen of Blois was an extremely weak monarch who relied upon the support of the pope. The Pope backed Stephen's cause, but only on the condition that he vowed to give the Church in England a massive degree of autonomy over its laws, lands, and money. After King Stephen's reign ended, Henry II took the throne in 1154 and pushed back against ecclesiastical power. Not because of any principle of equality before the law, but instead to cement his own power. <laughs> 
When Henry ascended to the throne, England had just come out of a massive civil war, which had aptly been dubbed the Anarchy by later historians. England's finances were in tatters, and it was up to Henry to restore the state's financial health. By setting up his travelling royal court, he could prosecute all people under one law, as opposed to delegating this responsibility to local authorities. This sounds good, but also had a bit of self-interest in there. Importantly, this also meant that he could collect all the fines and taxes for himself and help restore the state's financial health. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the aforementioned Theobald, John Superior, was an ardent defender of the church's independence from secular government, who had been exiled before under the reign of Stephen. But eventually Theobald died in 1161, and his successor Archbishop of Canterbury was none other than Thomas Becket. Being a past member of the King's Court, Henry expected Becket to be a perfect pushover, but instead, Becket, like his predecessor, defended the church's traditional liberties. It is during this time, with the backdrop of the conflict between the church and the state, that John Salisbury was writing. Despite the busyness of his work, John managed to complete writing what is today's best-known work, Polycraticus, by 1159. So far, all that has emerged from John's life was that he was a well-educated churchman, with no yet discernible liberal underpinnings. But John's interest in future liberal principles is evident when we read the Polycraticus. John wrote a few other books of note, but nothing is pertinent for a liberal audience today, so I'll limit myself to talking about Polycraticus only. Polycraticus is a Greco-Roman neologism from John himself, translating roughly to the statesman. It belongs to a genre known today as the mirror for princes, or mirror of princes. These were usually handbooks or treatises on how monarchs ought to act, both publicly and privately. It was a little bit like a royal self-help book. The book was for the king, but it was dedicated to Thomas Becket, and was intended to be read by the top echelons of English society. In Polycraticus, John takes on a huge range of topics, and that makes it overall not the easiest read due to its eclectic nature. If I were to attempt to summarize the whole book, I'd be here for quite some time. So instead, I'll give you the best bits. There are three important themes that I'll discuss. The three big ideas in Polycraticus that make it worth knowing about are John's articulation of the huge value of liberty, the importance of free speech for the government, and most famously, when it's permissible to kill a tyrant. John came at a time in Western thought when much of the seminal writings of ancient figures like Aristotle, Plato and Cicero were mostly lost, only besides a few fragmentary texts. His studies at university gave him a great sense of reverence for the wisdom of the ancients, and as such, John read and translated any he could find. He was most impressed by Cicero's De Officis and Aristotle's writings on logic known as the Organon. From Aristotle, John developed the idea of the golden mean. Well, this is Aristotle's idea. Aristotle believed that virtue is the highest good attainable in life, and that it is essential for human flourishing, what he called eudaimonia. Virtue consists of doing what is morally right, but what is morally right is not always so clear-cut and simple. For example, a soldier who has faced the battle has a multitude of ways to react. He can dull his senses of fear and throw himself headlong into battle and earn a heroic victory, or he can listen to his good instinct and run away from the conflict and preserve his life. For Aristotle, both of these approaches fail because they are too extreme, either extremely reckless or extremely cowardly. Virtue is not attained through extremes, but instead by moderating our conduct and finding the right balance. Cicero's thought and ethics resembles Aristotle, with him stating in De Inventione, each virtue will be found to have a vice bordering upon it. In other words, each virtue is between two extremes. So for both Cicero and Aristotle, virtue is always found between extremes, what will be called the golden mean. Now, this does not mean that the halfway point is always right, but instead that any point between excesses or deficiencies is right. To figure out what is right, we must develop our sense of practical moderation by weighing up our options and examining the actions and lives of others through what was called exempla, or moral examples. John wholeheartedly took on this philosophy, stating that naught is so splendid or magnificent that it does not need to be tempered by moderation. Throughout Polycraticus, John concurs with Aristotle and Cicero in the nature of virtue. John's moral beliefs transfer to the political realm also. If the only way to attain virtue was to use one's sense of judgment, John argued that liberty then ought to be given to the highest degree possible so that we may practice our skill of moral decision-making to become virtuous people. What's more, an obligation for one person might not be the same obligation for another. In times of war, physically capable people might be expected to enlist in the army, while people with disabilities would be exempt. Not all people have comparable situations, and therefore not all people have the same obligations. John wrote that virtue cannot be fully attained without liberty, and the absence of liberty proves that virtue in its full perfection is wanting. 
For example, if I am forced to go out and pick up trash on the weekends by a local authority, I'm not developing my sense of morality because my own judgment was not used. This is why charity and community service are viewed as very different things. But when rulers attempt to make people virtuous through heavy-handed means, John believed they eliminated any potential that people had for virtuous lives. Being under the threat of physical coercion for John was a condition similar to slavery. He described people dominated by theirs as the image of death, as their free will, what made them human, was removed. For John, liberty is best described as choice. Now, whether that choice is good or bad is up to the actions of individuals and their judgment. John argued that liberty means judging everything freely in accordance with one's individual judgment. Without practicing this judgment, there is no hope of attaining virtue. The faith of both virtue and liberty are inherently intertwined. As John stated, he who is most virtuous is most free, and the freest man enjoys the greatest virtue. But liberty also means the ability to make good choices and bad choices. When left to their own devices, people are not angels. They will not always be moral. John explained that, as long as the immorality of one does not harm another, it ought to be permitted. Taking a stance of moderate skepticism following Cicero's teachings, John believed that a ruler should always err on the side of tolerance. John condemns rulers who are too eager to find faults in their people's behavior and correct them or take revenge. Thus for John, tolerance along with moderation are essential virtues for any ruler. Sounding quite like some sort of proto-liberal, he said that the merit of tolerance is resplendent with a very special glory. Now, John was a medieval man, which means that he had some unsavory parts to his beliefs, such as that liberty ought to be curtailed and it threatened religious orthodoxy. While beliefs such as these dull his liberal edge, nonetheless, for his time, he was a unique thinker in his approach to the relationship between liberty and virtue. A cadre of aristocrats often surrounded the king, which is known as the king's court. John had traveled across Europe and had been at many different courts. His experiences showed them that the inner circles of various European courts were hotbeds of luxury, excess, and worst of all, flattery. At court, everyone wanted to curry favor with the king to get ahead. Kings commanded an immense amount of power, and being on their good side would result in wealth, land, and prestige. So kings tended to be surrounded by spineless suck-ups and sycophants that John called flatterers that would say anything to please their king. Members of the court were meant to help run the country, but flatterers did their best to appease the king with sweet talk and convince him to follow their plans, which were nearly always to benefit themselves at the expense of others. John observed that flatterers often obstructed open debate and criticism to make their ideas sound better. By suppressing conflicting and often better ideas, they make their own seem more plausible. John noted that flattery is always accompanied by deception, fraud, betrayal, and the infamy of lying. Flattery at the court in John's eyes led to the king following flawed advice. John criticized flatterers by citing Cicero's view on friendship. Cicero and John believe friendship is at its finest when pursued for its own sake, regardless of rewards or gain. Real friends are partners in the good life who strive towards virtue and truth together. Therefore, by definition, bad people can never be friends because they do not aim for virtue, nor do they care about the truth if it is inconvenient to their goals. John concludes that those who are vulgar and base flatterers are not to be admitted among friends. So if the good life depends upon truth and friends ought not to lie and deceive one another for gain, John stated that it's better to suffer the chastisement of a friend rather than the fraudulent kissing up of a flatterer. To the future king, he advises that free and open debate ought to be a regular feature at any well-functioning court. He argued that a good king would allow criticism, which would lead to people freely expressing what they thought was the best because no critic would be feared by a lover of the truth. John advised that those in power ought to be lovers of the truth, though the truth may be harsh when it is necessary, both in king's public and private life. From Cicero's writings, John adopted a stance of skepticism of absolute knowledge, Quite the diversions from the dogmatism which medieval thinkers are often associated with. John held that beliefs should be based upon their probability of being true, writing that, I call some things probable, some improbable. What is there then that I can hinder me from pursuing those things that seem probable, rejecting those that seem improbable? And while I shun the arrogance of positive assertion, escaping the recklessness which is at furthest removed from wisdom. In more simple English, the best way to attain something close to truth is to hear out every possible argument. In this case, what is true for the individual is true for the government. Free speech is the government's most valuable tool for assessing what the best course of action is. John believed the king ought to allow a great deal of free expression, writing that, even if criticism carries open or covert malice, to bear it is in the eyes of a wise man a far finer thing than to punish it. John understood that the health of society depends on the ability of free agents to speak out against oppressive and immoral conduct of the government. 
John's defense of free speech was based on its utility and exposure of poor government conduct, both in terms of policy and personal virtue. Ultimately, John of Salisbury is arguably most famous for his idea of tyrannicide, the killing of a tyrant. For the medieval mind, the Bible was the most authoritative source on right and wrong, but on the topic of tyrannicide, scripture wasn't always exactly clear. On one end, there are multiple tyrants in the Bible who are brutally killed, such as Holophanes, who is beheaded with his own sword by the divinely aided Judith. But, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, Jesus also argued Christians should obey authorities of the secular world, famously stating, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Many later authorities interpreted this as Jesus commanding Christians to obey the authority of secular rulers. St. Paul wrote that everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. These sentiments were not ignored. In the 5th century, the authoritative church father, Augustine, argued that nobody may kill another man, even a criminal. Augustine believed that the secular state was beneath God's divine morality, and thus had little interest in the efficacy of the state, which paled in comparison to the city of God. Thus, Christians should ignore the miseries of secular power and simply bear and grin until they reach salvation. The only time Augustine thought a tyrant could be rightfully deposed or killed was if he infringed upon Christians' ability to practice their faith, as this would jeopardize the entry to heaven. So, for the medieval mind, at this point, tyrannicide was generally quite a taboo topic. All authority came from God, and that included the state's authority. Therefore, to rebel against the state was possibly to also rebel against the will of God himself, who had established such states. A keen student of the ancients, John was influenced by his two best buds, Cicero and Aristotle, who both said that those who kill tyrants should be praised for their service. John argued that kings are not unlimited in their power. There is a higher law than them to which they must answer. Law is not the arbitrary whim of a ruler. Instead, he said that the law is the gift of God, the model of equity, a standard of justice, a likeness of divine will. These kind of natural laws of justice from God cannot be ignored wherever the ruler wants. John said that every magistrate is but a slave to justice. Adherence to the law is the defining quality of a proper king. In fact, the primary difference between a tyrant and a king is a relationship with the law. The authority and the legitimacy of the king depend upon his adherence to law. Tyrants are characterized by an antagonistic relationship with the law. The tyrant thinks nothing is done unless he brings the law to naught and reduces the people to slavery. By replacing law with the arbitrary will of another, tyranny takes root. Unlike Augustine, who argued for silently suffering under tyrannous reign, John argued that after a degree of suffering had occurred and the tyrant's intentions and behaviour were evident to all, tyrants had no right to protection. John pointed to times throughout history when tyrants met the gruesome ends. After listing his extensive examples, he concludes that it is only permitted, but it is also equitable and just to slay tyrants. For he who received the sword deserves to perish by the sword. Tyrants commit a crime that is worse than just a regular crime. Instead, he commits a crime of majesty. And he said that, it is permissible for all to prosecute those charged with the crime of majesty. At times, John upgrades the permissibility to a duty, writing that whoever does not prosecute the tyrant sins against himself and against the whole body of the secular republic. As long as the killing of the tyrant is done without loss to religion or honour, there is no reason not to kill a tyrant. But despite all these great points, John's advice generally tended to fall on deaf ears. By the 1160s, John was reluctantly drawn to conflicts between Becket and the king, where he supported the former as his secretary. However, in reality, John viewed both parties as overly stubborn in their positions and wished to form some sort of compromise. John eventually fell out of favour with the king, who viewed him as merely a mouthpiece for the church's ambitions. John was forced into exile in France for a large chunk of the 1160s. By 1170, the king had enough of Becket's defiance and purported to have said, Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? A group of knights took this entreaty literally and murdered Becket in cold blood, with John as a witness to the brutal event. Though he continued to serve the English church, John was eventually promoted to a bishop of Chartres in 1176, where he did not achieve much of note besides promoting the memory of Becket. By 1180, John passed away. In subsequent centuries, John became renowned as a name among scholars who admired his non-dogmatic and rigorous analysis of politics. Before John, few medieval thinkers had applied speculative philosophy to politics due to their view that public affairs is a corrupt activity. But John demonstrated that politics does not have to be so debased and can in fact incorporate the highest of moral principles. Since the fall of Rome, the Western world had not seen such a grand attempt at philosophizing about the nature of politics. The scholar Kyrie J. Netterman writes that John Salvary richly deserves reputation for having restored the theoretical study of politics to a place of prominence in the intellectual system of the medieval West. That is some hefty, and in my opinion, justified praise indeed. John of Salisbury is by no means an unambiguous liberal hero, 
Restricted to the dominant beliefs of his time, he took monarchy as the one and only competent form of government and had little room for religious toleration in his philosophy. But I think we can forgive some of these unfortunate anachronisms based on when he was writing. After all, John himself did write of his old teacher Bernard of Chartres that brings to compare us to dwarves perched on the shoulders of giants. He pointed out that we see more and farther than our predecessors, not because they have keener vision or greater height, but because they are lifted and borne aloft their gigantic stature. In other words, we are all standing upon the shoulders of giants, of those who thought and came before us. In this vein of thought, John represents an upward thrust towards the priceless values of liberty and free speech. The medieval ages are hardly a time renowned for tolerance, liberty and rebellion, so the fact that John preached these values at all in this intellectual milieu is extremely impressive. John Salisbury is not a commonly known name today, even amongst the biggest political philosophy nerds. But John deserves a bit more credit than simply being a wallflower of political philosophy's canon. He was a key figure in revitalizing the classical tradition of synthesizing high-minded philosophizing with politics, an endeavor rarely taken up until he wrote Polycraticus, which repopularized this trend. Liberals and libertarians alike ought to respect a man who reclaimed the righteous tradition of setting a check on the absolutist powers of rulers and urging rebellion when such rulers turned out tyrannous. John's legacy is as timeless to us as were the writings of ancient Greece and Rome to him. Thanks a for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you may listen to podcasts. Visit the website www.libertarianism.org to find more podcasts like this one. I hope to see you next time.